Directors now, we're absolutely delighted to have Peter back with us today. As you know, at the start of the pandemic uh, lockdown, Peter came and gave a, a first session to our artist colleagues on the pandemic payments and social welfare issues that many people were having. We felt it was the right time to bring him back and have him um, come and give you more information on the next, what ha seems to be happening now. And just to say to you all that, as we all know, Peter is um, an actor, theatre maker, accountant, colleague and friend, and we've, we're really blessed to have somebody of his um, intelligence available to us on, on, on these matters. Over to Peter. What an introduction. It's not going to get any better than that. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, good to see your faces there. What a crazy time we're all going through. Um, as as uh, Siobhan said, I'm going to talk about the pandemic unemployment payment and, and the recent changes. But before I say that, I'd like to say we are all a community and we've all got each other's back. If anybody's in big trouble, give us all a shout. We'll dig in. We'll do whatever needs to be done. That's how I feel. I'm sure everyone else feels the same. Um, so yeah, just up front, wanted to say that. Okay, so the pandemic unemployment payment. Uh, just a really quick uh, summary of what it is, when it came in, and what we're looking at now. So it was one of the supports that came in at the start of this pandemic. You were able to get it if you were in employment immediately before 13th of July and lost your PAYE job as a result of the pandemic. So you had to have been in employment on the 6th of March and you let go by the 13th of March. Or if you were self-employed, uh, you could also get it if, to use the language that they used, if your trade had collapsed to such an extent that if you were offered a full-time employment, you would take it. Now, whatever the hell that means, you know, you can, you can parse that in any way you want and come up with a different answer. But basically, that was it. And they didn't really give any other guidance. So as we discussed in the previous session, if somebody, which often happens, if somebody kind of started trading, and again, I'm using the language that revenue and social welfare used, if they started getting work as an actor or a theatre maker or director or whatever else that wasn't through the PAYE system during 2019, so they've started trading during 2019, there was a very good chance they might not have even registered with revenue by the time this thing kicked off in 2020. Our advice at the time, my advice, my feeling at the time, was that you could probably apply as a self-employed person as long as you then went back probably and registered as self-employed from 2019 or possibly even from 2020. I felt that you could do that in good conscience if there was some truth to it. I didn't feel you could do it if there was no remnant of any self-employed activity at all in 2019 or in 2020 thus, thus, thus far up to that date, but I felt that you could in good conscience do it if, if that was the case. So they assessed most people and in, in a lot of cases people applied, they might have ticked the employee box because they might have kind of gone, well, I did have employment coming up as a PAY job and it's now been cancelled so therefore I should get it. Uh, and they might have ticked the employee box, but that wasn't the case. You weren't going to get it for cancelled PAYE work. You had to have been in a PAYE employment. So some people got rejected on the first uh, application but they went back and applied as a self-employed and in most cases they still got it i have one case i'm looking for at at the moment in which they didn't tick as a self-employed and they still didn't get it and we're trying to figure out why i feel that's good grounds for appeal but for the most part people uh, got the 350 a week and even in cases where somebody was on job seekers allowance at the date that the thing kicked off around the 13th of march they still, the first answer they got was no, they wouldn't be put onto the pandemic unemployment payment. And then advice from the Department of Culture came back to say if they went back and talked to them again, they would be bumped up to that payment. And I think in some cases that worked out for people, and in some cases it didn't work out for people. Okay, so that gives us a kind of a, a rough, uh, very brief introduction of what the whole thing was. That's what we're talking about today. Um, there's some people, we're about to talk about dropping down in rates for some people. And I just want to say up front that there doesn't seem to be a consistent approach to how people have been treated. So if you've been bumped back down and it feels terribly unfair, you're not alone. In some cases, if you're still on the higher payment and that kind of, you're kind of going, God, I don't know why I'm still on that payment. That doesn't surprise me either. I've, I've had a few people come to me saying, I definitely should be on the lower payment. I'm on the higher payment. Will they come and claw it back? And I'll try and kind of cover that as I go because I don't think there's a simple yes or no answer to that either. Um, 
the, the, at the moment, the best advice we have is that the pandemic unemployment payment will finish on the 10th of August. So that's the final date. It's, it's, uh, there's another thing going on, the temporary wage support where you have an employee, it seems to be going till the end of August. At the moment, the pandemic unemployment payment is going to finish up on the 10th of August. Whether or not that gets extended, we don't know. Whether or not that gets extended for people who work in the arts and other areas which have been uh, particularly um, affected, I don't know. I'm not suggesting it will be or that I've got any indication that it should be. But I think that between Theatre Forum, Irish Theatre Institute, Equity, etc., you know, there are uh, submissions being made to try and recognise the fact that, you know, other jobs are possibly going to start kicking back in we're looking down the barrel of a, a a much trickier gun at the moment so you know who knows what's going to happen okay so that's pandemic unemployment payment bit of history to it and the fact that the rates have been cut now here is a summary of the rate change and, and kind of how it seems to be working how it should be working as per the rules and how it seems to be working in practice so the rate cut should have shown up earlier this week on Tuesday the 7th of July was when you should have seen the rate either being cut from 350 to 203 or remaining at 350. So this is how the rules say that they've calculated this. If you applied as a self-employed person they will go back to your 2018 self-employed earnings and self-employed earnings only not self-employed plus BAYE and if your average per week gross before any tax is above 199.99 so that's 200 a week if you are 200 a week average per week in 2018 self-employed earnings you should retain the 350 rate if your average earnings self-employed in 2018 were below that you should be getting the lower rate that's the rules obviously i know i've even seen some faces on that that have a different situation like that that it hasn't worked out like that but that's what the rules say so that's for self-employed people if people were a PAYE worker and let go because of the pandemic between the 6th of March and the 13th of March, then they will be assessed on either their 2019 PAYE earnings or their 2020 PAYE earnings, whichever gives the higher number. So they look back, if you had 15 grand worth of PAYE income in 2019, which is an average of around 300 euro a week, compared to say, 100 euro a week in PAY earnings in January, February 2020, they look at 2019. If your January, February 2020 was much higher, they look at 2020. That's roughly how it's supposed to work. So self-employed people are supposed to look back to 2018 and check your average. If you earned, to get to about 200 euro a week, you have to have been earning roughly 10,300 for the entire year. So that's self-employed. For PAY workers, uh, they look to either your 2019 or the first two months in 2020, whichever gives the higher weekly average rate. So that's, that's the rules. Now, what seems to be happening in practice is that they seem to be, this is, this is now I, I mentioned this to Siobhan beforehand, and it might explain some of the inconsistency I'm seeing. One client of mine got an email back. This person had more than sufficient self-employed income in 2018 to get the higher payment. But they got an email back having appealed via email to the crowd, which I'm going to go through the appeal process now. They got an email back to say that uh, if you had any employment income in 2019 or 2020 at all, you would be treated as an employee. So that meant that someone with sufficient self-employed earnings in 2018, but with a small amount of PAY income in 2019, 2020, seems to have been given that average. Now, I think that's incorrect. Uh, they, they referenced the PUP rules. Um, I can't find one document that has everything. I can just find the, see ya, see ya buddy, see you later. Uh, they, I can only find one document that, I can only find all of the uh, pages on either social, mygov ID, mygov, mygov.ie, or on the citizen's advice. There doesn't seem to be one document that captures it all. If anyone has put their hands on that, great. So I've asked this client to go back to say, me so sorry folks <laughs> see you buddy uh thanks buddy uh, so they so basically i asked this client to go back and ask this person to what rule are they referring because i think that person is wrong i then rang the helpline this morning and remarkably got through on one call at around 10 o'clock and again the person i spoke to couldn't get her head around the idea that somebody was both 
self-employed and a PAYE person. So I, I went into it in a little bit of detail. The person was very friendly and she just kept saying, all I can say is appeal to the email address with the documentation. So a lot of inconsistency. I feel if you tick the box as a self-employed person in the first instance, then you should be assessed on your 2018 self-employed income. Because if you ticked it as a PAYE person and didn't have any PAYE, like weren't in an employment, at that time, you wouldn't have got it. They were easy, they were quick enough to reject it as an employee then. So my feeling is that, why would they then go back and look at your employment earnings? But you know, we'll keep working on that. In fact, Owen Carrick uh, did a very good email um, where he has uh, done a, appealed it. And if, if Owen is happy with me sharing that email, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Owen, Owen is giving us a big thumbs up there. So we're all good there. So based on that, um, if people want to uh, ask me at the end to go over those rules again, just because I know I threw a lot of information to you there, uh, both in relation to self-employed, PAYE, 2018, 2019, 2020, I'm more than happy to do that at the end. But that's roughly the rules as I understand them. Um, okay, separate to that, so sorry, the appeal process. The best way to appeal it is to email PUP re-rate at welfare.ie. So that sounds like it's if they're saying the PUP re-rate at welfare.ie. So I'm presuming they're, they mean they've re-rated you from 350 to 203 and you it's about the PUP. So PUP re-rate. It's on my Twitter page and it's, it's all over if you Google appeals. Um, and send your documentation. If you tick the box as a self-employed person and your self-employed earnings in 2018 are above 10 grand, send in your 2018 tax return. If you haven't done your tax return um, yet for 2018, which is understandable, that happens, expedite that and get it in and then send it off to them. Um, when I say sending in your tax return, for me, that's the Form 11. It's when you're doing it online, it's the thing that comes back that says Form 11, acknowledgement of return, something like that. Um, okay, so that's the appeals process. The next very important thing is we're now on the 10th of July everybody has to confirm their eligibility. Quite separate to the re-rate, they have to confirm their eligibility for the payment by the 13th of July. And you have to do, it, the best way to do it is just do it online uh, through your My Welfare, My Gov uh, account, but make sure you do that. And also maybe everybody stick it on their Twitter account, their Facebook, just in case somebody's not on this session, doesn't know they're supposed to confirm their eligibility, because I think that they'll be quick enough to cut people off. So that's confirming your eligibility by four days from now, three days from now, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, three days. I think I could count a number of days. Okay, so spot checks. Uh, I've had a number of people come back to say that um, they've had an email, particularly situations where somebody started trading in 2019 or 2020 and hasn't done anything about it. They have got, and, and also it didn't have any employment in the first months of 2020. They've had emails back from social welfare to say, uh, we've checked with revenue and there doesn't seem to be any record of employment or self-employment and we want you to confirm whatever is going on. In that case, what I feel those people should do is register with revenue as a self-employed person, uh, do it from the, the t time you started trading. So, you know, as we said, people could legitimately have started having some self-employed income in 2019 and not done anything about it. They should just register from the start of 2019 and let them know you've re now registered. Maybe you can register online via my account, which is the, the revenue login when you're a PAYE person, and most people should have one of those accounts. So you can register for income tax uh, through my account and having done that maybe take some screen grabs and send it on and tell them you're working on your 2019 tax return. My feeling is that should at least buy you some time. Um, if you're only registering from the start of 2020, I would do the same thing. So yeah, that's my feeling is that, yeah, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. There seems to be a small number of random verification checks. Um, if people have got a verification check and they just don't know how to answer it, just drop me a line via Twitter. Um, if you're not on Twitter, my email account is peterdailytax at gmail.com. Just drop me a line and I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. We said at the start, uh, I'm going to go through the questions I've been given now, but uh, I put up during the week on my Twitter account that I was doing some research in this and I got a huge number of emails through Twitter about different people's different circumstances and followers and stuff like that. I'm more than... Uh, more than open to anybody sending me uh, any type of a query in relation to this 
on Twitter, you're not just doing yourself a favor, you're doing me a favor because I'm expanding my knowledge as to how this whole thing is, is playing out and it's giving me uh, uh, knowledge that I can go back to my own clients uh, and so forth. So there's no problem with that. I'm on Twitter on Peter Daly 10 Twitter. Uh, great. Okay, some questions now. Everybody doing okay? I just do a very quick, yeah, thumbs up, getting thumbs up, yeah. Nobody's losing the will yet, great, lovely. So, very good question. How does the COVID pandemic unemployment, um, unemployment payment affect my stamps? Stamps are your PSI contributions, which it's very important to keep up for a number of things, including your job seekers benefit entitlements and also your maternity benefits and your state pension contributory. Long time off, but yeah, keep up to date with all of your stamps as much as possible on those. So the way the pandemic unemployment payment works is that you will get stamps, you will get a PRSI contribution for each week you're getting the pandemic unemployment payment. And it will, given, it will be given to you in the same, at the same stamp, type of stamp, which I'll explain in a second, as you were on previously. So if you were a PAYE worker, uh, working in January, February and a bit of March, you're paying what are known as Class A stamps um, and they contribute to state pension and maternity and job seekers benefit, full stop, because uh, I'm going to talk about job seekers benefit self-employed in a second. So if you were previously getting A1, paying A1 stamps through employment, your weeks getting the PUP payment will, will give you more A1 stamps. If previous to this you are paying class S stamps, which are the ones you pay when you have at least 5,000 worth of self-employed income in a year, when you do your tax return, you'll find that the PRSI section will have a payment and usually it's at least 500, although I'll explain now in a second why sometimes it's less than that. Um, you are getting 52 class S contributions for each year you're, you're doing a tax return and you've got your self-employed income. There, uh, if you now are on the PUP payment, you're now getting class S contributions. Okay, does that make sense? Um, in fact, I said I would explain sometimes why the, P, the PRSI self-employed contribution is less than 500. I'm not, it's too complicated for this, but if you wanna know why, send me a quick email and I'll explain. Okay, so you're still getting stamps for this. How is the rate of tax due, how is the rate of tax due back on the PUP payment calculated and when is that tax due? Okay, so basically, what's the tax going to be on the PUP payment? Okay, the Irish Times had an article at the end of May that confirmed that the PUP payment is taxable and it will be taxed by income tax, but not USC and not PRSI. As you all know, I'm sure, there are three taxes that come out of your income. Income tax, which is also known as PAYE, USC and PRSI. You won't have any PRSI, that's the 4% one. You won't have any USC, that's the 2%, 4.5%, 4.5, 8%. I think there's another one. Anyway, 0, 2.5, 4.5, 8 You won't have any of that. So you're back in the area of the 20%, 40% first tax, income tax, PAYE. That only kicks in if you have income of above 15 grand as a self-employed person or 16 and a half, group, 16 and a half grand as a as an employee. So basically, if your income, including the PUP, is below 15 grand and you're self-employed, you won't have any tax on this. If your income as an employee plus the PUP payment is above 16 and a half grand, you're gonna probably be paying tax at 20% on the bit above 16 and a half grand. So say you look back at the end of this year and you're a self-employed person and you're overall income is 18 grand, then you'll have the same tax or tax bill you would have had if you had self-employed income of 18 grand, irrespective of the PUP in a previous year. So whatever that ended up being, that's what it's gonna be. For self-employed people, I think it's, it's akin to just including it as a no, another invoice you've sent out. Um, it's gonna be taxed in the same way. My feeling, someone has a question later on about expenses during this period and I'll cover that. But for self-employed people, just consider it, it's, it's another client who paid you roughly, what is, it, what is it, 14, 15, 16 weeks at 350 per week and whatever that ends up being. PAYE workers are going to be treated slightly different. Say you're a PAYE worker and your PAYE work in January and February plus your PUP payments in this period were off and then say, for example, you managed to get back into another PAYE job at the end of this and you've been, say, say in the whole year, 
you've got 20 grand worth of PAYE plus PUP income. The bit above uh, the 16 and a half grand is going to be taxed at 20%. So that's the really simple answer. That's 20% of the bit above is around 700 euro. But to complicate things further, if you've already been paying tax, like if there's tax deducted on some of your PAYE income in January, February, that will of course go against this. For PAYE workers, the way this is going to work is that at the end of the year, revenue is going to do some sort of an assessment on you. They're going to either ask you to uh, do a form 12 or they're just going to do this automatically for people. Uh, and then they're going to work out if you owe them tax. And if you owe them tax, they're not going to send, my understanding is that they're not going to send you out a bill for 700 euro, 200, 500, 1,000. They're going to code it into your tax credits over the next year or two. So, so what they're able to do is that everybody gets tax credits of about 3,300 per year, and that reduces the amount of tax you pay and increases your take-home pay. By reducing the tax credits, it'll just take a little bit of it out of your pay each week over the next year or two years. I'm gonna go back to gallery view. Does that kind of make sense? Complicated enough area? Okay, I'm getting mostly nodding heads. I'm gonna go with that. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, somebody has asked, Coming off the payment for a short time, short period, is it possible to get back on it? And are there measures in place to support freelance workers who have short term contracts and needs to pause their payments for short periods of time? I feel that the answer to that question is probably no. My feeling is that if you come off this payment, it would be very hard to come back on it. So in that instance, where you have a short time contract, is there any way at all of pausing it until the payment is up in four or five weeks time, 10th of August. Um, and that can work in whatever way you want. Um, perhaps you could agree with whoever you're working with that the work will be done after 10th of August and you will invoice them after the 10th of August or something like that. So my feeling is that no, for the sake of four or five weeks, I would stay on this payment if you can. Um, Someone has asked, is there any guidance for people who earn income through PAYE and self-employed and the PAYE income has remained, but the self-employed has collapsed? Are there any supports available for those who have double jobbing to earn a living? My understanding is that no. And, and, that, and that's being confirmed by um, some of the questions that Revenue have asked about the eligibility. In fact, can I detour back to the eligibility? Because I know this is something that is kind of causing people a little bit of anxiety. As part of the eligibility that people have been asked to do by the 13th of July, you're being asked to confirm, to declare, amongst other things, you know, living in the Republic of Ireland, information truthful and accurate and complete, um, and you'll be prosecuted if it's not. You're being asked that you're not being paid by your employer. I think that's, that's, that's a given, because if you're being paid by your employer and it's going through PAY, revenue and social welfare will pick it up anyway. So it's the second part of this sentence nor am I receiving income from self-employment at the moment. So that seems like a very black and white question to answer. Am I receiving income from self-employment at the moment? That kind of is slightly inconsistent with the rules around whether a self-employed person was eligible for it. Because as I said earlier in the session, a self-employed earning person was eligible for it if their self-employed income had collapsed to such an extent that they would take um, a job if it was a full-time job if it was offered to them so there's a bit of an inconsistency and um, I don't quite know how to answer that question um, you, if you're getting a significant about amount of self-employed income you know certainly above 350 a week I think it would be hard to justify that you are not receiving any self-employed income if you're getting another 100 euro in for something between now and the end of the period of 10th of August, I think it would be a very cruel appeals officer who would decide that that meant you weren't eligible for any of this income. Um, perhaps if you've received 100, 200, 300 over the four, next four or five weeks since you make the declaration, perhaps you could place that aside in the knowledge that they might try and claw that back. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what people think about that one because I don't quite know how to answer it. It's a tricky one because my feeling is that you can't give out a set of eligibility criterion and then say, give us a black and white answer to this question or give us a black and white question to that. Okay, so that's that. Um, 
Yeah, okay, there's a very good question here. If I were to receive one of the Arts Council bursaries that are cur currently open, should I come off the COVID POP or is a bursary somehow separate? Bursary is taxable income. Um, it might be artist exempt if you have artist exemption already and you're getting the bursary to, um, to do something to do with that activity, i.e. writing, etc. But it still gets taxed under USC and PRSI. In that instance, my feeling is that you're getting the bursary, again, this, this kind of covers some of what we covered before in the earlier session. My feeling is that you're getting the bursary to do something and possibly you can't do that something until things open up. You know, you, you might be sitting at home writing, but you also possibly need to go to the library and do some research or you need to interview people. And if you can justify that the activity hasn't started and that technically you, you haven't um, recommenced trading, then maybe you might just get away with that one. But again, I would put some documentation, some contemporaneous documentation in place. By that, I mean, you might send an email to the Arts Council to say, listen, thanks for the bursary. Again, I've no idea how this might work out in practice. Send an, an email to the whoever's giving the bursary, say, thank you for the bursary and I've received the money in the bank account. I can't actually start doing anything because of pandemic until uh, such a period, such a time when everything opens back up, including theatres, etc. Maybe that might work. You know, you're dealing with um, social welfare appeals officer who might necessarily know uh, how our business works. So I suppose you're just putting as much um, information together that can present that can um, support that case. Basically, the picture we're presenting is that all of our trades have ceased or employments have ceased and they're not able to recommence until after the 10th of August. Um, Will artists be automatically transitioned to job seekers after the 10th of August or will they have to apply separately? They will have to apply separately. So you won't be transitioned to anything after this. Um, and later on, someone has asked me about job seekers allowance as an artist. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm also going to talk about job seekers benefit as a self-employed person. Two slightly different things. Um, if I'm paid a grant for production costs on a show, also covering two weeks of my time, so I'm guessing that somebody is saying they've got a project grant to do a production and part of that project grant is their own fee. Should I stop the COVID pandemic unemployment? The show has been in development for a year, so I'm assuming not. My feeling is that it's the same question as earlier. You're going to um, uh, try and delay any activity until after the 10th of August in whatever way that works for you. So if I've been, if I'm paid a grant, maybe you could defer, you know, with all these grants, you have a choice about when you draw the payment down, maybe just defer the drawing down. Does that answer? If, if whoever this is on the call and it hasn't answered that, just, just stick it in the chat at the end. Um, okay, that's a quite, yes, somebody has asked about, yeah, this is a good time to talk about the Job Seekers Artist payment. Job Seekers Artist is a fairly new thing and it came after some very good lobbying from Theatre Forum, ITI, uh, National Campaign for the Arts, Creative Ireland, etc. And it's the idea that when you're on Job Seekers Allowance, you're constantly being activated, sent for job interviews that might not necessarily be in the area that you want to work in. Like me as an accountant, if I sign on the the dole. I'm not sent for interviews for anything other than accountancy and they understand that. But artists seem to be put in a different category. So there was a recognition that, you know, this is a very valued pr profession and should be valued within social welfare in this way. So they came up with an uh, idea that you could sign on for job seekers allowance, which is a means tested payment. It's not to do with your stamps. So you have to not have any income coming in or very little, and you have to not have a huge amount of money in your bank account. Um, but you had to be registered with various organizations. And at the very start, it was quite narrowly drawn. It was um, the Writer Center and it was Visual Artist Ireland. So it was writers or visual artists. Now it is, you can Google this, but it's um, Visual Artist Ireland, Equity, Irish Writers Centre, Musicians Union of Ireland, Dance Ireland, Musicians Union, SIP2, SIP2 uh, Writers Guild of Ireland, Screen Directors Guild of Ireland, and the Irish Street Arts Circuits and Spectacle Network. So there's a lot of organisations you could be a member of and you can go in uh, and apply for Job Seekers Allowance. Now there are other uh, qualifying criteria as well. For example, you have to show that at least 50% of your income from the previous year is to do with being an artist. Just go in, if you, if, you, if you feel you're not sure of it, but you're on Job Seekers Allowance or thinking of going for Job Seekers Allowance, just go in and talk to them about it and kind of dig your heels in and see if you can get onto it. 
again, it's means tested. It's supposedly only for a year. And it's like this language on the government's website. It says, you know, it's to allow an artist to get their portfolio together over the first year that they're trading. So as you can see, whoever drew that guideline is taking the very narrow definition as to what an artist is. It's a visual artist who is, you know, producing a body of work that will then get them into gainful self-employment and never have to look for any support ever again. So, you know. So anyway, the question really was, um, what documents will be required to prove you're an artist? So you have to qualify, uh, sorry, you have to be a member of one of those organizations and then just go in and talk to the social welfare about what else you need. Again, have a look online, this to do with the previous year's income and so forth. But I have a funny feeling there's a bit of flexibility once you go in and talk to them. Um, it talks about, um, uh, you have to prove you're self-employed to avail of that job seeker's benefit. And they ask, do you have to provide a tax return or a letter from revenue? You don't have to apply a tax return, but you do have to register as self-employed with revenue. And I mentioned earlier on, to do that, you just go onto my account and register for income tax. But don't register for income tax unless you're absolutely sure that you want to be doing Form 11 tax returns in the, in the next few years. Because once you register, you automatically have to keep giving returns in until you deregister. If you're not sure what I mean about that, just drop me a line. Um, okay, I've received one payment from a voiceover since going on the payment. Does this disqualify me from future, I'm guessing, PUP payments? So this person has got one payment from a voiceover. I'm gonna add in the words, I've received one payment from a voiceover that I did before the 13th of March. That's one way to answer that. Another way is to say, look, you're, so that person has got paid for something they did before their trade ceased. Another way to look at that is that um, that person has done the voiceover during their, um, during their, this period. But I still feel that voice, that self-employed trade has collapsed to such an extent. They would, they're available to take a full-time job. The voiceover might've been one day, so they're available for the rest of time. That's another way to answer it. Now, if that person got paid 10 grand for that, uh, voiceover and it's gone into their bank account or even if they've got paid more than the entire pandemic unemployment payment there's always a chance that social welfare might just say yeah grand i'm sure you're okay just give us a quick look at your bank statement and they look at that payment and go well what's going on here so i suppose it is about building an argument that they're relying on the fact that the guidance and the rules say my trade has collapsed to such an extent that i could have been available for uh, full-time work. I'm, now, I'm just making this up as I go. Could that person now send a quick email to an agency on today's date, say, listen, I'm available for full-time work if you hear of anything going? I don't really know. So that's me trying to answer that in a helpful way. There are some outstanding payments of work stopped halfway through the pandemic. What happens if I get paid while on pandemic payment? It's the same question, I feel. If there are outstanding payments from the period before this all kicked off, I think that's probably fine. And again, if you can back on, up with invoices dated before the 13th of March, that's really helpful. If you can defer payments till after this to reflect that you're gonna start working again, that's really helpful as well. Um, someone is talking about how do they deal with an honorarium for a writing course they're attending. Perhaps they could delay the honorarium till after the 10th of August. Again, if they have a few days on a radio play in August, after the 10th of August would be helpful. Um, profit share from a play in August after the 10th of August would be helpful in that situation. Um, someone said that this is a similar thing again. They have some paid training coming up and they're on the COVID PUP as a self-employed person. Do they have to sign off um, to do this? And does it mean it can't go back on even if it's only a short term? Look, again, it's about possibly maybe in that situation they said they've got some paid training come on up i know that these things are probably inflexible but if they could delay giving the training till after the situation and under my breath i'm saying if they could delay invoicing till after the but i'm really saying delaying and um, doing the training till after that would be helpful um yeah and getting back on it i i just think that Getting back on it is seems to be a no-go situation. By the way, the applications to go on it are still open. So if somebody managed to get on okay for the first two months, but now their trade has collapsed, technically my feeling is they could apply for it. Now maybe I haven't had any feedback. Maybe if you made an application today, you would just get, no, forget about it. You should have known this already. But I'd be interested to hear if anybody does actually go, 
maybe I haven't missed the boat, I'll make an application because it's still open. I checked it this morning. Um, yeah, and this is somebody said, am I allowed to earn any money while receiving the COVID POP as a self-employed person? And the online declaration uh, suggests not. So yeah, I would agree with that person. It does suggest not, but I'd also point back at one of the rules that's still up there that says your self-employed income has collapsed to such an extent. So it's the difference between any versus none. Also, somebody gave me a shout yesterday to say that they rang the helpline to say that they had got like, 100 euro here and another 200 euro there during the last eight weeks or so and the person they spoke to who as always they say was very helpful said at the start oh you should definitely come off the payment and by the end of the conversation said oh look i think you sound like you're okay it's not a huge amount of money so if you've got that kind of subjectivity going on um, and this person also said that at the very start of the call it said the call was being recorded so they will be relying if there's an appeal uh you know, on that advice. And I've got that person's name and maybe that could be useful if somebody finds themselves in that situation. Okay, so those are the first set of questions that come in. The next set of questions that come in are, it's the same thing again. If you're offered a small amount of work, is there any way you can take the brief work without losing the payment? I feel we've answered it. Either try to do the work after the payment invoice. Um, so this is now. Um, this was a, a one that I wasn't sure I fully understood. I'm a freelance independent theater, theater professional, so I pay taxes as a self-employed person. But the social welfare documents seem to expect you to have registered yourself as some kind of business entity when you're self-employed. I don't have anything formal like that. It's just me working contract to contract, like most of us. Would it be wise, what would be wise for me to do here? Set myself as some kind of company or business? Or can I keep going as a person with various different jobs and contracts on a regular basis? Yeah, there's no need to set yourself up as a company. Uh, you can keep going. That person sounds like they're doing everything that most of us are doing. You're working as a sole trader, which is a business. So the person that said at the end, should I set myself up as a business? If you're registered as a sole trader with revenue, which is, this, which is to use revenues language, registered for income tax. Um, and, and telling them about the trade that you're doing. That is you registered as a business. Um, there's no need to incorporate. Um, incorporate is an additional amount of costs uh, and compliance. It can make sense and is very sensible for certain people, but there's no need and there's no requirement. And social welfare in particular, I don't think, um, I don't think that would do you any favors, in fact, to be registered as a company. Uh, I'm happy to go into that in more detail if anyone wants to give me a shout separately. Um, it's the same question again. Is any work or significant work, is it any work or significant work that would disqualify me? Uh, it, very inconsistent. And even my phone call this morning, couldn't get an answer. Um, yes, I've covered it already. Will the COVID payment be taxed? Do I pay this in 2020 taxes as self-employed? Yes, as a self-employed person, it will be included in your 2020 taxes. What normally happens with taxable social welfare payments is that it shows up as pre-populated in your Form 11 tax return. So it should show up there. I mean, obviously, we don't know what that's going to look like until 2021 when they open up the 2020 tax returns. But my understanding is that it will show up as taxable. Um, I had a little work online and was paid for it while in receipt of the COVID payment. It was not enough to live on or even for a week. Will I have to pay this back? The answer is I don't know, but I'm relying on this phone call that this person made to the helpline where they said at the start, you shouldn't have been getting it at all. And by the end of the phone call, they said, oh, look, I'm sure you're okay. So again, if this person, if the amount isn't that much, what they might do is they might Put that aside if possible, if possible. I know how tough things are. Put it aside in the knowledge that it might be clawed back. Um, hope it won't, but yeah. Okay, so somebody else has, has said, my work is a mix of PAYE and self-employment. They have put me on the lower rate, which I think was an error as was assessed via PAYE. It is not worth the stress to pursue for a couple of weeks payment. I have two weeks work, but if the payment is extended on for longer, should I pursue it? I feel just pursue it. Send an appeal to the email address P-U-P re-rate at welfare.ie with your 2018 tax return showing income above 10,300 and say, I feel I should be on a higher rate. And this person is right. If they do extend it, you know, there could be an extra, I mean, I don't think they, I don't know if they will, who knows, but yeah, even if they don't, if you manage to get the extra 147 for four weeks, that's, that's a good, that's a good result for one email sent off. Um, 
Yeah, this is a really good question, I think. Can I claim business expenses incurred during the time I was getting the COVID payment? Things like guitar strings, heat, etc. My business wasn't operating, but I feel like these were maintenance costs. Okay, so if your trade has ceased, you probably can't claim costs during this period. But I think every single self-employed person will be including their usual rent that they've paid for the full year, phone bills they paid for the one year. I certainly won't be advising my clients, listen, as soon as you were down tooling for three months, we'll just exclude three months of the mobile bills. Revenue don't get the level of detail unless they come and review it and audit it. Um, and I just don't think those are the things they're going to be focusing on. And also we're talking about, you know, not a huge amount of money in this person's question, but it could be a huge amount. For example, someone meant, may have had to keep up the rent on their studio or whatever. My feeling is it just included all. And what I always say to my clients, A, let's hope the question isn't asked, and B, if the question is asked, let's hope that we can give an answer that's plausible and that revenue can accept. So yeah, I wouldn't take this period out because you know we're this is unprecedented, it's never happened before. No one knows how revenue are going to deal with these type of queries, but you know, you gotta keep your business humming while everything's going on in the hope that you can get back and hit the ground running after this is all finished. Um, so somebody else said, I've had my POP payment reduced due to low income in 2017 and 2018. Now they've said 2017, that shouldn't be relevant. So I'm guessing that might be either an error or they meant 2018, 2019. I have requested they assess me again, good. Uh, and instead use last year's income, which is 2019 as an employee, as that would be sufficient. That's a good question. And whoever that is, if they want to let me know how they get on. So what they seem to be saying is that they um, were assessed on low income in 2017, 2018, but they've higher income in 2019. As I mentioned, if you're an employee, they will look at 2019, work out the average, and 2020, work out the average, and then give you the better of those two options. Um, because they've mentioned as an employee, if 2018, 2018 as an employee should be irrelevant. So it's only for self-employed people. So yeah, if that person wants to give me a shout and let me know how they got on with that appeal. Um, and I think that is everything. I just want to see I had a few pages printed out. Was there anything else I felt was important to say? That's it. So. Um, Peter, we've actually had a couple of um, things kind of come up in the chat that I think we'll look at trying to address now, if that's okay with you. So um, first, um, somebody asked the question, uh, Kathleen Warner Yates asked the question, the pandemic unemployment payment finishes um, August 10th, which is a Monday. So is the last payment Tuesday, August the 4th? That's such a good question, Kathleen. The, um, my understanding is that the payment week runs from a, I'm going to look it up and I'm going to look it up as we're after answering the next question. It's a funny week. It's not a Monday to Sunday. It's either a Tuesday to Monday, which explains why they might be doing on the 10th, or it might be like a, yeah, it's definitely not a Monday to Sunday. I think it might be a Tuesday to a Monday, but I'll look it up because I, I saw it this morning. I went, or during the week when I was researching this and I went, okay, that was something I didn't know because they said it in the context of, you would find out your new rate by the Tuesday the 7th and it would be based on the previous odd week. But it's a good question and it's a very easy one to answer. I'll check it out and get an answer back to you. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so we just have a series of um, anonymous questions now. Um, so the first is, could you ask whether income from, uh, is income from 2018 subject to the artist um, exemption being taken into account? It's a really good question and it would seem there might be a little bit of inconsistency there. It should be. There's no reason why it wouldn't be. It's taxable income. It just ha so happens it's not included in income tax. But I've had at least two people came, come to me to say they think that's the reason why. And in those situations, what I would say is to go back with an appeal, showing your tax return, and if to make it as helpful as possible. Your tax return might have like the income that is taxable for income tax in one place, but your total income, including the artist's income in another place, highlight the total income and explain it in the email. The person you're dealing with may not even have heard of artist exemption or don't know what it is, but it is taxable income. It's including total income in many of the different definitions of what is total income. Um, but but sorry, just to, just to underline that, it might explain why some people have been bumped down and I feel it's good grounds for appeal. And also uh, we'll make sure that the Department of Culture by we, I mean ITI, Theatre Forum, National Event for the Arts, will make sure that that is something that shouldn't cause any confusion. 
Yeah, and uh, just to reiterate, we'll repost the email address that the National Campaign for the Arts uh, did a lot of work in, in getting to, you know, let the department know kind of where these gaps in the system exist. And um, so um, another question in there was from an artist who was based in England and doing their tax returns there in 2018. Uh, could Peter advise if I should submit my UK tax return to appeal my re-rate? No, definitely not. Don't give any indication at all about the UK because one of the, um, one of the things is that you have to have been currently living in the Republic of Ireland. I'm sure this person is and was when they applied, but to give them anything to do with a different jurisdiction is just going to confuse them. In that situation, what I think I would do is give the most recent information. Uh, somebody had sent me an email via Twitter saying that they've sent off invoices for 2019 to show that they're doing, you know, they're in business and, and trading. They just haven't done a tax return. I wouldn't give the 2018 because I think that it would be too easy for them to just kind of go, doesn't qualify. Okay, and uh, the next question I have here is, um, will the payment be backdated? For example, I've been changed to 350, uh, I've been changed from 350 to 203. It'll most likely be a few weeks before it's all sorted. Do you reckon we get paid out the 147 from each week we've missed when it's rectified? Yeah, yeah I think so. That's my understanding based on uh, queries, the comments they made at the very start of all this, where they said, you know, if you apply for it and you don't get it, but then you're upgraded, say you don't get it and they put you on job seekers allowance and then you get upgraded to the 350, you'll get the back pay. I'm using that as, uh, you know, I feel that that's, that's enough for me to say that, yeah, if you get bumped up, they'll give you a backdated payment. Um, brilliant, thanks. And then if that, I've got if, that a... doesn't, if that person doesn't, maybe they'll drop me a line and we'll figure out an argument to make on their on their basis on their behalf perfect thanks so just anecdotally somebody has messaged here saying that somebody they know actually had to give their bursary this goes back to the kind of bursary question give their bursary back in order to get the covid payment but they said um more info they can draw it down again but actually had it in their bank and had to transfer it back can i ask that person if they won't mind saying it anonymously who said they had to do it was it social welfare or was it uh, advice from their accountant or whatever else because that would be useful here but that sounds like a very sensible because on the face of it you're kind of going I've got this money I can't do the work because we're now in lockdown so I'm going to give it back until I can do it work because my trade has ceased obviously I think in most funding bodies uh, cases the idea of money coming back into their account might just melt their heads so I'm surprised that even the funding body in that situation was open to that but I'm delighted they were um, another question here, how will they verify self-employment income if we are not uh, forthcoming with documentation? Can they ask for your bank statements? They can, well, obviously it's in your interest to give them it, to get the payments out of them. Um, if you don't give it to them, I imagine that would be the end of the situation. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, social welfare does have do you know what? I deal mostly with revenue and revenue absolutely can ask you for what you want, what they want. And if you don't give it to them, you can lead yourself open to prosecution. I'm guessing social welfare in this situation where you've been given a social welfare payment can also do the same thing. Um, I'm reading between the lines slightly. Perhaps that person doesn't feel that they would retain the payment if they didn't give the documentation. Re revenue or social welfare have said that nobody will drop below what they were previously paid. Um, sorry, yeah, nobody will drop below what they were previously paid. And what they're saying there is that even if somebody only had 1,000 euro worth of income in 2018, they will still get the 10 grand, sorry, they will still get the 203 per week. Because as long as you are anything below 199.99, you'll retain the 203. So in that situation, my feeling is just, as, unless the documents are incredibly self-incriminating, I would give over the documents. Um, should I declare self-employed income from 2019 and 2018 as a PAYE employee, or should I register as self-employed and do it that way? I am still a PAYE employee in receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment. So, um, could you read that out to me again, Catherine? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I get it. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Should I declare self-employed income from 2019 and 2018 as a PAYE employee? Or should I register as self-employed and do it that way? I yeah. am still a PAYE employee in receipt of the PUP. 
and, and I'm guessing that that person is getting the 350. So this is a slightly separate question. If they're getting the 350, or maybe they're not actually, maybe they could follow up with that. Maybe that's why they've asked the question. Whether or not they should declare that income for 2019 and 2018, um, it depends. On, first of all, you should always declare income to revenue because they'll catch up, they might catch up with you at some point. But whether or not they should declare it as a self-employed person through a Form 11 tax return, which can capture self-employed income and PAY income, depends on whether or not the level of that self-employed income is above or below €5,000. And that €5,000 is after expenses. So if you have self-employed, or actually to, to use the wider definition, if you have non-PAY income above five grand after expenses, in any tax year, you are supposed to register for income tax and do a long form Form 11 tax return. So in that person's situation, I think I would um, uh, check to see is the income above and below five grand. If it's below five grand, uh, and this is not to do with the level of the PUP payment, just stick it in a Form 12, which you can do via my account. Mm -hmm. If they're asking the question because they have a big chunk of self-employed income in 2018, and they're wondering, should I now go and do the 2018 tax return, get registered as self-employed, and then get a higher PUP? I have a fully funny idea that by the time this whole plays out, they'll be out of time to do that, but I could be wrong. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, another, another question in there. So I'm on a higher PUP rate as I was about to go into rehearsals for a show on the gate. I wasn't under contract yet. So now I'm thinking I shouldn't have gotten this payment at all. Any thoughts on this and thoughts on the uh, on confirming eligibility? Yes. I was working in the Gaiety uh, School the day of lockdown, but that payment, that was a payment I invoiced for, not PAYE. Okay, so it sounds like this person wasn't in a PAYE job at all in 20 uh, on the 13th of march 2020 or any time between the 6th of march it sounds that they've applied as a self-employed person because as i said if you tick the box for pay that was one of the only it seems like one of the only checks they were able to do in quick time was read check very quickly were you on revenues database as an employee with an employment during that week and if you weren't they rejected it so i'm guessing this person applied as a self-employed person so in that case what it sounds like they did is went back to 2018 and if that person has self-employed income above 10 grand they should be okay but it also sounds like because of the way they've done it that person may have had quite high paye work in 2019 in which case they might have stayed on the 350 rate this might be bad advice, but my feeling is that that person maybe just um, keep their head down because if they're saying they seem to be okay, it's based on, if, if what I've just said doesn't make any sense, if they kind of go, well, actually, I didn't even do a tax return in 2018 and I didn't earn anything in 2019 as a PAYE, maybe drop me a line and see if we can answer it a bit better. But for now, it sounds like you're meeting one of those two muddled criterias, criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, so then just a reply to the um, kind of earlier conversation about bursaries. So the person said, I don't know the exact details, but I think it was a conversation between the Arts Council, the person and welfare. Can't swear in it though, but fairly certain that welfare insisted and Arts Council was the funding body. Okay. Um, so just a little bit more information there. Look, isn't that, isn't that an indication of a kind of a practical response to um, making sure artists get supported during this time but still then presumably are are able to access that money after and keep things going i think that's a really sensible response and i'm hoping that will be the response if for example they came back and looked at somebody who had like 250 from something one of the weeks in may or something like that i'm hoping that there'll be some sort of sensibility here and if there isn't we'll all go on strike Good call. <laughs> uh, so a question now from Anthony Kinahan to the group. If you want to transition straight onto job seekers benefit directly after the 10th of August, can I apply for that before the 10th of August or do I have to wait until after the 10th of August to put that in the yeah, application? Really good question. My, my feeling is don't do anything until the 10th of August. Don't kind of go in and confuse them because that's quite binary in their thinking. And it actually takes me into a little bit. Um, Anthony mentioned job seekers benefit. Job seekers benefit uh, used to be very straightforward. Up until the end of 2019, job seekers benefit was if you were a PAYE worker 
And if you applied in a year, which is 2020, they would look back to, in the first instance to 2018 and check to see if you had, and I think it's 39 weeks of A1 contributions. So that's, that's, a, that's a high bar to meet. And if you're a successful jobbing actor going from one PAYE job to another, you still might meet 39 weeks. So what they then did was, if you didn't meet that, you could take 26 weeks from 2018 and 26 weeks from 2019. But at the end of 2019, they brought in job seekers benefit for self-employed people. And the way that they did it is that they looked back again to 2018 and they checked to see if you had 52 class S contributions. And as I mentioned earlier, you get 52 class S contributions if you have at least five grand worth of income in your tax return. So it's a much lower bar to meet. And I think it's, it's, it's a useful thing. Now, it's the same as the other jobs because benefit. It only lasts for a certain period of time. And also, uh, somebody mentioned to me that, you know, you get different amounts depending on your income. I didn't know that before. I thought it was at the same rate. But again, that's just, I'm not that familiar with the social welfare side of things. I just have happened to check out the eligibility. So in Anthony's case, if nothing is going on after this and he goes into social welfare, the first thing he says is that I am a job seeker. I'm looking for work. I am also registered as self-employed with revenue because I previously was trading. And they'll go, okay, first things they should do, they should look to Anthony's PAYE contributions in 2018, irrespective of whether or not he's now registered as self-employed. Because that is, that's a confusion in the past. It doesn't matter. You should still look to the PAYE contributions, first of all. And if he has enough in 2018 or 2018, 2019, he should get job seekers benefit as a PAYE worker. If he doesn't, they should look to his job his PAY, sorry, his class S contributions in 2018, and then see if he has enough to get job seekers benefit as a self-employed person. If he doesn't have either of those, he should then be assessed as a job seekers allowance person, someone seeking work uh, and available for work and doesn't have the means at the moment. He can also go, okay, you've gone back to my job seekers, my PSI contributions in 2018 and worked out I have 52 class S contributions and now you're looking at my income and you're only giving me 90 euro a week. And actually I'd be better off on job seekers allowance. And my understanding is that he can go to job seekers allowance, which might be a higher payment. But again, if anyone has real life experience in that, please let me know. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so a couple, I, I realise now it is um, 12, but we've got maybe six more questions kind of coming okay here. That, yeah. So um, we might just keep going to try and address them all if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so um, is the 2018 assessed income net or gross? Gross, which is the one before tax. Cool, thank you. Um, so this is, I don't think there's a question in this one, I think it's more common. So it says, it was originally stated that if you did not get the first couple of weeks of the pandemic payment because you were either late applying or had to appeal, that those weeks would be made up at the end. Um, my husband went from the pandemic unemployment to wage subsidy scheme when his PAYE job came back, but he hasn't gotten the unpaid weeks of the pandemic unemployment payment yet. Yeah, to go back to the very start of that question, uh, the person said that, excuse me, um, that there would be a suggestion you would be paid at the end in two different scenarios. One of those was when you're late in applying. I, I, knowing how social welfare operate, if you're late in applying, they don't tend to go give you the bits before you applied. For example, if you finish a PAY job, but you don't manage to make it into social welfare's office for two weeks, they won't go from the day to the what used to be the P45, they'll go from the day of the application to the best of my knowledge. So in that situation, I'm not sure that'll work out. But for the earlier bit, I, I, I guess it does. And there's something on, definitely on one of the social welfare, yes, where it says, um, you know, it talks about getting the payment that might increase if you had child dependence. Um, and it says it may take some time to process this additional payment. But in the meantime, you receive a minimum of the 350 and any additional payments will be backdated when it is paid. I'm guessing that person's talking about that situation where they, they might have got, but, but not, I don't, I don't think in the case where somebody has taken a couple of weeks to apply. Okay. Again, if, if somebody finds out that's not correct, maybe let me know and I'll post it up on my Twitter or whatever. Brilliant, thanks. Okay. Um, so another question here, two artist household here, uh, both on COVID for now. When we return to job seek, uh, when we return to draw job seekers, will one artist receive payment and the second artist be dependent? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know enough about the social welfare to see how that might work. Um, yeah, not sure. Sorry. 
Um, if I received one or two small self-employed payments for voiceovers while receiving the pandemic unemployment payment, should I tell social welfare or wait until they come looking for bank statements? So, um, I don't know, I'm going to put on gallery view. I'm going to just do a really quick thing. If you think this person should uh, tell social welfare, will you nod your head? And if you think the person should shake, not tell them, will you shake your head? Yeah, I'm getting a consensus here. Um, my feeling is that, look, it's not like this person is trying to willfully uh, defraud the system. You're in a situation where you've got like a little bit of income coming in. Um, you're relying on the fact that your trade has collapsed to such an extent that if somebody gave you a full-time job, you would take it. Um, you've been paid for a day's work or an hour's work or something else. You've got to rely on that. Um, my feeling is that if you tell social welfare, they're going to have to do something about it. But perhaps a better uh, thing would be to just keep it in the back there and just go, you're relying on that. And when social welfare, if they come knocking, print out the bit that says, but my trade collapsed to such an extent, maybe send an email off to an employment agency to say, have you any full-time work going? But yeah, I'm not sure that I would tell social welfare at this moment in time. But then nope. again, I'm, I'm not really, social welfare again, and like I know from people who are registered as self-employed and they go in and tell social welfare, they've got a few days as a self-employed person. And like one time out of two, everybody says to me, it depends on who you speak to. And yes. one time out of two, the person in social welfare goes like this to them. Oh, what do I do with this? I don't even know what to do with this. So it's a really tricky one. And social welfare are used to dealing with people who are either employed or unemployed or self-employed or unemployed. Um, uh, last two questions here, I think now. So um, if I've been bought out for year two of an advert, work originally done in 2019, will I lose the pandemic unemployment payment? Am I right in thinking to be extra safe, invoicing and payment should be delayed until after August the 10th, if possible? Yes, I think so, yeah. I answer there. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and then the last question we have here, I've been cast in a show to hopefully start rehearsals in September. Great. I am preparing the form for Monday the 13th. Should I enter not sure for expected turn to work as the September date could change? Yeah. Uh, click not sure. Um, I'm sh that, that's the first part of the form. Um, and I think that's more of a, I'm hoping that's not, it's the bit where it asks you, um, do you think you'd be going back into self-employment within a month, within three months thing? I think that's a statistical thing that they're trying to get a sense of what's out there. Uh, my feeling is don't confuse um, social welfare at this point with any reference to what might or might not happen in the future. It's my instinct. And also that's a bit of um, general advice. If somebody's going into social welfare uh, and they know they've got a PAYE job coming up in three months time, don't confuse social welfare by telling them that, even though you think it sounds great because you're going to say to them, listen, I'm not going to be a burden for more than three months because then I've got a job coming up. It confuses them. At the moment, you have to be a job seeker looking for a job. So, you know, if you've got a job coming up, you might not necessarily be in a position to take a job. That's just to let you know the binary thinking that people from social welfare tend to, you know, be trained to, and probably rightly so, think. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. So that's all the questions from the chat for now. Um, I don't know if there's anything else or maybe I'll hand back to Siobhan just to wrap everything up then. So thank you very much. Not at all. Um, but basically, I think we'd all like to give Peter a big round of applause. Um, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, Peter has very kindly offered to be there, guys, uh, for you. If you so, if you have any queries, um, you can contact him via his Twitter account or his Gmail account. He gave those, and we'll have them as well available for people. If you have any questions on that, we can pass them on to Peter. Um, and as he said himself, it's really good if we get as much information, so that at least we've got one source in Peter who knows, who understands um, the system and how it works. Um, I'd also like to let you all know that Peter's play is um, will be on in Druid Fuel next Thursday at 7.30. I'm sure all the details and links will be in his Twitter feed and in the Druid feed. Um, and on behalf of ITI I'd like, and all of you, I'd like to once again thank Peter Daly for his fabulous contribution. Thank you. <laughs>